Uh, oh, by the way, where are the electrons coming from that this oxygen is donating? Well, when the tail of the arrow is on a negative charge, that really represents that they're coming from a lone pair. Now, actually, usually people on, you don't need to draw this lone pair. Usually lone pair is not drawn. However, actually, it's good for a beginning student to always draw the pair of electrons that are moving, just so they can be clear in their mind about what the electron pushing arrows mean. So I'll go ahead and put this pair of electrons in, even though it's not conventionally necessary. All right, well now, this carbon is gaining this bond. In order to avoid exceeding an octet, it has to lose something. Well, that's why it's good that it has a good leaving group over here. So I'll draw again the pairs of electrons that are moving around here, and then we can draw our products. Uh, so let's see, this I is going to leave. Uh, and we know what happens to this pair of electrons? Well, it turns into a lone pair on the iodide. I'm not going to draw all the pairs on the iodide, but I'm going to draw the pair of electrons that we're focusing on. Uh, again, you actually don't need, to have, you don't need to draw even this, but I'm going to draw it just so we can see what's happening here. Um, and then this guy over here, the base. This oxygen is taking the pair of electrons and putting it into a bond with the hydrogen. It's always a good idea to actually draw the bonds that have been formed. So I'll draw this bond here. And then it's crucial to make sure that we've got the charges right. Well, every step of reaction, you're always going to change exactly two charges. Every step of any reaction, you'll change two charges. The charge at the initial tail and the final head. You see why I call this the initial tail and this the final head in the series of arrows. This is losing electrons and it started negative, so this oxygen should end up neutral, like we have here. And at the final head, this iodine started neutral and is gaining electrons. So it would be negative. It's always good to check your net charges. Well, my net charge here is negative one on the left and negative one on the right. So we got that reaction uh, correct. So here we have this elimination. Again, we can see why is this called elimination? Because the way we formed the pi bond was by eliminating this hydrogen and this iodine from here. You can see this is actually a pretty complicated reaction. There's three arrows all going through simultaneously um, over here. Um, okay. Uh, and again, the big mistake people make is taking the proton from the alpha carbon when they should be doing it from the beta carbon. How many steps are there in an E2 reaction? One. One step. So don't let this number two fool you. There's only one step because all this stuff is happening simultaneously. So what's the rate determining step for E2? Well, that's a trick question. If there is only one step, then that one step is the rate determining step. Um, why is this called E2 then? What does the number two stand for? Well, it stands for the fact that there are two species participating in the rate determining step. That's actually something that might be tested on the test. That's good to know. In this rate determining step, both the base and the substrate are participating. Since there's two molecules participating in the rate determining step, that's where the number two comes from. But this number two doesn't indicate the number of steps. This is actually one step, which is very important to keep in mind. So when you mean that, does that mean that, like, so since both the substrate and the base affect the rate, that when you increase the concentration of either one, the rate's going to increase? Is it always yes. that relationship? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that also could be tested. Um, anything that participates in the rate determining step will affect the rate of the reaction. And since there is only one step, everything is in the rate determining step. So it matters that we have a good base, it matters that we have a good leaving group, and it matters how much of the base and of the substrate we have. All those things can affect the rates. And that's the same for SN2, right? They're, like the E2 right. and SN2 regarding rate determination are the same, and then the SN1 right. and E1 are the same. That's right. SN2 and E2 are very similar and uh, SN1 and E1 are even more similar. That's right. Now we know that SN2 and E2 are not identical because we know steric hindrance is a big, obst big obstacle to SN2 and not a big obstacle to E2, but they're still very similar in other ways. By the way, we can see why steric hindrance is not such a big obstacle um, over here. What, what happens in, uh, what's the difference between a nucleophile and a base? Well, what does the nucleophile have to do? A nucleophile has to join the substrate. But what does the base have to do? The base just takes the takes proton. Something. Yeah. The base just steals the proton and then runs away. It doesn't actually have to attach to the molecule over here. So who has to get closer, in a sense? The nucleophile has to get so close it can actually form a bond, whereas the base just gets close enough to lean in and take that proton and then run away. So it, um, it's always good, whenever possible, not only to learn the patterns, but to try to understand them, both because that helps you to remember them better 
and because it helps you to adapt to new situations, and also because you might just be asked directly on the exam what the reason is for any of these things. Okay, so why is steric hindrance a big, uh, that blocks the nucleophile a big obstacle to SN2? Because nucleophiles have to get close enough to the alpha carbon to join. And why is steric hindrance that blocks the base not a big obstacle to E2? Because the base does not have to get that close, it just has to lean in and grab a proton and uh, then get away. So it's always good to uh, know the patterns and to uh, be able to explain them. So here, because we're forming a double bond, we're not going to have to worry about the stereochemistry, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Every reaction we go through, we have to ask, is there important stereochemistry? Uh, and in fact, it turns out in this particular example, there was no stereochemistry, but there can be stereochemistry for E2. In fact, that was kind of the question you guys asked me at the start. So now in a second, we're ready to go through and cover the stereochemistry for E2. Once we finish up these basics, in a second, we'll go to that stereochemistry. Um, Let's take a look at the handout again. Um, let's take a look at page one of the handouts. So page one of the handout tries to summarize all the key characteristics of SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. You can see again, it, unfortunately, it's pretty complicated. There's lots of characteristics, but you really are expected to have pretty much everything on this page one mastered. You should be able to come up with this on your own. So hopefully having you in one place will help. So let's take a look at the handout here. First of all, if you look at, uh, at the top, there's a picture of an E2 reaction. At the top, there's a picture of E2 that reminds you how it works. You can see that the base attacks the beta carbon, although I didn't label the alpha and beta carbons. Maybe I should have done that. It's good to label the alpha and the beta carbons. In the handout, I put the alpha carbon on the left, even though on the board the alpha carbon's on the right. But we can adapt to that. All right. Uh, and then that basically shows, um, all right, and that basically then shows us uh, everything we have uh, on the board. Um, now let's take a look at the row for big obstacles here. If you look at the big obstacle row, that summarizes some of the key ideas we've talked about. So the big obstacle to SN2 is steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. That's, uh, that's important. Uh, the nucleophile matters because it's in the rate determining step. RDS there stands for rate determining step. Uh, the things that matter are in the rate determining step. But you can see that under big obstacles, blocking the base is not a big obstacle because the base doesn't have to join the substrate. Uh, okay. Uh, and by the way, on the right-hand side, we haven't talked about this, but the big obstacle to SN1 and E1 is stabilizing the carbocation, because SN1 and E1 reactions form a carbocation. SN2 and E2 don't form carbocations. So if, uh, if you only learned one thing on that page, it should be the big <laughs> obstacles, because the big obstacles explain everything else on page one uh, of the handout. So those are the two things that are most important uh, to know there. Okay, so uh, those are our basic ideas, and then we can start talking about the, uh, the question you started with, this dip with the stereochemistry. Uh, does this make sense so far? Yeah. I have one question. Um, the st so like for stabilizing the carbocation, you can't, you can't have a primary carbocation in SN1, right? Because it, it just reacts too quickly? Um, so basically, you can't form primary carbocations, period. Primary carbocations are too unstable to be formed, um, and therefore you can't do an SN1 reaction with a primary substrate. But you can do an SN2, right? Because That's right. Of concept. Yeah, the, the reason you can do that is because there is no car you don't need to form the carbocation in the SN2. So it's, it's an intermediate step, right? Kind actually, of um, actually, there just is never a carbocation in an SN2 or an E2. You can see that with the E2. Notice that there was never any carbocations here. Yeah. There was never any carbocations, so, uh, so that's why stabilizing carbocations is not an obstacle for E2 or SN2, because we don't form any carbocations. Uh, we did an E2, but it would be the same for an SN2. There would not be any carbocations. We might as well look at the pictures at the top of the page. So if you take a look at um, the top right, it shows the picture for SN1 and E1. What, what happens first? In, what, what, how many steps are there in an SN1 or an E1 reaction? Two. two steps. The number one is misleading. There's really two steps. And what happens in the first step? The first step is the removal of the leaving group by on its own. That's right. The leaving group leaves, both for SN1 and E1. And what, get left, what gets left behind when the leaving group leaves? A carbocation. You can see from the picture that when the leaving group leaves, that leaves a carbocation. And that explains why the big obstacle is stabilizing that carbocation. Because nature doesn't like charges. Nature That's doesn't like that charge. The SN1 and the E1, um, it's more likely to have this reaction when you have an excellent leaving group, right? That's right. Um, why is the leaving group especially important there? Uh, because it's just about the only thing in the rate determining step. So yeah, it, there's two steps in SN1. Um, first, the leaving group leaves, then the nucleophile joins. But which of those is the hard step? The leaving group, the leaving group leaving, because that forms the carbocation. 
it's easy for the nucleophile to join then because that gets rid of the carbocation. Nature loves to yeah. get rid of the carbocation. So you can see that's labeled on the picture here. The first step uh, here is the slow step. The first so step is the rate determining step. It doesn't matter how long the nucleophile takes to get there. So it could be a weak nucleo nucleophile for the SN1 and E1. That's right. Because the nucleophile is not the problem for an SN1 or an E1. The problem is forming the carbocation in the first place. The problem is forming that carbocation in the first place. So yeah, the quality of the nucleophile is not a big issue there um, anymore. So let's see, the point we were going to make is that we form the carbocation first in SN1 and E1. So um, the big obstacle is uh, stabilizing that carbocation. However, if you look at the SN2 reaction on the left, there's only one step and there's no carbocations because the leaving group leaves simultaneously with the nucleophile joining. So there's never a positive charge left behind on the carbon. Um, so there is, so you can have an SN2 on a primary carbon because it's never going to be a primary carbocation. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah.